everybody, this is the M Crew Dude. When it comes to Rare, they've certainly had their ups and downs. I mean, yeah, they've put out a couple duds over the years, but we mostly remember them for their awesome games such as GoldenEye, Donkey Kong Country, Battletoads, Banjo-Kazooie, Viva Pinata, and of course Conker's Bad Fur Day. Now, all those games are great, don't get me wrong, but whatever happened to Perfect Dark? Serving as a spiritual successor to GoldenEye 007, the original Perfect Dark was released on May 22nd, 2000 for Nintendo 64, and while reviews for it were really good at the time, the series has been dormant for years. The game was quite innovative for its time, and a small line of additional media followed the release, such as two canon books, a graphic novel, a remastered version on Xbox 360, and a game on Game Boy Color called Perfect Dark, which is actually a prequel rather than a port. The game I want to talk about today is the other prequel, Perfect Dark Zero on Xbox 360. This was originally developed for the GameCube, and later for the original Xbox after Microsoft acquired Rare. The game was eventually released on November 22nd, 2005 for the Xbox 360, which makes it one of the console's launch titles. I wanted to cover this game for a couple of reasons. I've never played it before despite having played the original, and I want to appreciate the fact that I'm playing Perfect Dark Zero in March 2020, which is when the game takes place. The game opens up with a pretty sweet introduction with a lot of great editing and upbeat music. It really greets players with the awesome potential that the console is capable of, but sadly, all of that excitement fades away pretty quickly. After that cool and flashy intro, the game opens up in a world that is run by greedy mega corporations, eerily similar to reality. We see Joanna Dark as she is set in a VR simulation course where she infiltrates a Datadyne facility, which serves as the game's tutorial. I mention the fact that it's a simulation first, to spare you from the disappointment later. Joanna was voiced by British music composer Evelyn Novakovic, who composed the score in the original game, but now, she's voiced by American actress Lawrence Bouvard in Perfect Dark Zero, which explains her change in accent. It turns out that Nintendo originally wanted an American voice actor for Joanna, but Rare did not like the idea. So, why did they change it now if they were no longer working for Nintendo? If anything, it just messes with the continuity. She also looks nothing like her original design. What, did she go through a redhead phase before joining the Carrington Institute? Her partner, Chandra, is voiced by Joe Wyatt and sounds more like a phone sex operator than anything. Okay, to be fair, she also voices Siri in The Witcher. You gotta be quick off the mark with this thing. Give it another go. Nobody does it better. So we learn the basic moves. How to crouch, shoot, dive roll, and so forth. It's not too complicated. The technology is pretty cool, and it sets up a pretty decent atmosphere for the game. One thing that I've noticed already is that the security cameras take a lot of abuse. Why are they strong enough to withstand up to five bullets? From what I remember, the cameras in the original game only took three. Also, like the original, the pause menu is accompanied by loud, upbeat music. The music is nice and all, but why does it have to play during the pause menu? What if I have to take a phone call? I would have to walk out of the room. Kind of defeats the purpose if you ask me. Also, I find it funny that the D-PAL is a Samsung product in this universe. Apparently Samsung paid to have their logo associated with an evil mega corporation. Hmm. Okay, so I looked into it, and it turns out that during a promotion, the game's boxes came with inserts that allowed players with Samsung phones to access exclusive content such as ringtones, text tones, and wallpapers. There was also an exclusive sweepstakes where Samsung gave away 250 Xbox 360 consoles to winners. Okay, so back to the tutorial. It's not the best. There are a few enemies to fight, but not many. In fact, most of the enemies we shoot are robot spiders, and everyone starts panicking as they seem to organize a hostile takeover. I didn't realize we were dealing with an Avengers level threat here. The flying drone makes a return, and while the drone is more prominent than it was in the original game, it still feels very clunky and hard to control. The camera is crammed into a small circle, which really limits your field of view. The dialogue is also laughably awful, especially in the mid-level briefing sections. After you complete a level, one of the characters gives you a paragraph of story exposition and a briefing on your next assignment. After that, we have a loading screen before the next level, and rather than loading during the briefing, they decide to give us gameplay tips during that time. It's fine at first, 
but it gets a little exhausting after the fifth time, and there are 14 missions in the game after the tutorial. From what I understand, Joanna needs to rescue a scientist with the embarrassing name of Ziegler from a dude named Killian. Once the next level loads, we watch a pre-mission cutscene as if the briefing didn't give us enough information. For a game that's centered around stealth, the gameplay does not reflect that at all. The first level in Hong Kong tries to throw you into a stealth segment, but enemies spot you very easily, and just like Dark, you know, that vampire game, once an enemy spots you, the entire area knows where you are. Shooting is pretty responsive, and you do have full control of your aim. The original had sort of a lock-on targeting mechanism, where your cursor would automatically target enemies, but I didn't have too many issues with the shooting in this game. The game also warns you not to shoot innocents in the nightclub, but where's the fun in that? The game doesn't even restart automatically if you fail. You need to press select to retry, so it's almost as if the game wants you to get the massacre out of your system before you want to take things seriously. The guards won't attack you in the club if you are unarmed, but even holstering your gun can't be done without a few hiccups. Why are there two separate commands for holstering a gun and throwing it on the ground? Why would I want to discard it? If I swap it out for a new gun, it would make sense, but it's such an arbitrary and ridiculous control scheme. We soon find Jack Dark, who's Joanna's father, and Killian, who has glowing red eyes, as if having the word kill in his name wasn't enough indication that he's a bad guy, and he jumps out the window and survives the fall somehow. The next few missions in China vary from generic cities to snowy mountains, but for some odd reason, Joanna constantly changes clothes in between missions. I know she's a special agent, but come on. There's also a scene in the original where Joanna knocks out a guy in an elevator, but now they try to sloppily recreate that scene, but without any of the charm. I know it's kind of annoying to keep comparing it to the original, but when you make a new installment, you have to build off what's already established. So in the original, the levels felt very open and it was really rewarding to explore them. You had the option in some cases to think outside the box to avoid guards, and it gave the impression that the world actually reacts to what you do. Here, there is nothing of the sort. All you do is go from one place to the next, and if you wander off the beaten path, the game projects a line on the ground for you to follow like we're a hamster in a maze. The plot feels a bit all over the place, but from what I gathered, we have to rescue Dr. Ziegler because, I don't know, he has some kind of research, I guess? And after we do, he whips out a neural what's it device and implants his research into Jack's memory somehow before he dies from the injury sustained from the torture earlier. So Jack and Joanna get separated, forcing her to cover him with a sniper rifle with the worst scope I've ever dealt with in a game before he gets captured by a guy named Zhang Li, who is the founder of Datadyne. We then have to fight and kill Killian while he flies around in this absolute bullet sponge of an aircraft. When we arrive at Zhang's guarded fortress, he makes us fight his daughter, Mayhem, in a VR deathmatch before we run off to rescue Jack. After flying around in a hovercraft for some unspecified amount of time, Jack gets killed by Mayhem, sending Joanna into a rage where she burns her face with the thrusters from the jet. Why did Mayhem have to kill him? Wasn't the purpose to extract the data from his memory? So Chandra and Joanna follow a lead to some underwater base like the one from the tutorial to find some scientists that can decrypt the data that Ziegler implanted in them. After killing two murderous cowboy brothers... Good God, I just said that. We find Dr. Carroll after massacring the whole base, and we discover that this experiment is some ancient version of Rosetta Stone that can read any form of hieroglyphics, apparently. I'm not even joking. So we get a massive dump of plot threads as Chandra kills Dr. Carol and betrays Joanna as Zhang has made her a better offer, and we soon meet up with Jonathan Steinberg who helps us escape. I should cover this character briefly. He played a major role in the original, but he was mistakenly named Jonathan Dark even though there is no established relation in the story. He was originally intended to be Joanna's brother in early drafts of the story, but this was changed last minute. His surname is Dark was a mistake that was left in, so now, Rare renamed him to Jonathan Steinberg to retcon any intended relationship. After the escape, we are introduced to Carrington, who is a laughable stereotype. As if his voice wasn't enough of an indication to let us know that he's Scottish, let's just have him wear a kilt. 
So the plot really starts to lose me because now we have to explore some South American jungle with foliage so dense it's almost impossible to see incoming threats, and later to a temple where alien artifacts are being examined. Oh yeah, I almost forgot. Aliens were a major plot point in the original, but we never see them or acknowledge them. Unfortunately, this means that there's no Elvis. There are a few generic traps that get in your way, and since the game mechanics and physics are broken beyond belief, this is more trouble than it's worth. There are some blocks that you'll have to push to make this bridge come up, and the only way to really move them is by hitting them with your gun. It actually took me a little while to figure this out. So after that, we, for whatever reason, move on to Africa. Next up, Africa! So we run around Africa and fight more bad guys before a fight with Mayhem who is in a hovercraft. It's not too hard, just kill the driver before her. We then cross this massive bridge in the desert because we need a reminder that Halo 2 is a much better game, and then we fight Zhang Li, who is after some ancient artifact that he uses to go all attack on Titan and jumps around in floating platforms. After a very unexciting battle, he dies and we are immediately treated to the game's credits. After all that time spent, we only get one achievement to show for it. Unbelievable. Before I wrap up, there is a co-op mode to play with a friend where the second player controls one of the side characters, which I guess is alright, but then you have this very basic and unexciting multiplayer. I couldn't find anyone to play with for obvious reasons, but why would I even invest my time in it? The only thing I could think as I was spawned into an empty map unable to move was, why me? Well, that was Perfect Dark Zero, and I'll admit, it does work in some areas, but as a follow-up to its predecessor, it really fails. The style in the original had a fun cyberpunk setting and a fun atmosphere, but now, everything is just really generic and devoid of all the things that made the original special to begin with. All the cool locations like Area 51 and the alien conspiracy plot never come into play, as we are treated to a very bland origin story where Joanna has been reduced to a very bratty and unlikable character. Her bright orange hair is a real eyesore, and she has no resemblance to her original character design. She's just impossible to connect with on a personal level, which is really unfortunate because the trailer in the original game established her as a badass, despite the whole the only person man enough to handle a job like this is a woman crap, which you'll be glad to know I won't discuss here in detail. Rather than showing some sense of maturity as she goes through hardships, loses her father, and becomes a hero, there is really no development of character here, so it's almost as if she's a completely different person. The gadgets are all pointless minigames that are surprisingly hard to get the hang of, and once I finish the puzzle, I'm left confused as to how I solved it. Not to mention, they all have stupid names like Data Thief and Loctopus. The level designs are uninspired and too linear, while at times they aren't specific enough. The enemies all barely function with idiotic AI that make them a pain in the ass to fight. Something that I'm sure was really cool at the time is that enemies actually respond differently depending on where on their body they're shot. I once shot a dude in the butt and he said verbatim, my sweet derriere. Besides the basic soldiers and other enemies that only attack you when they're provoked or alerted, there's really no variety other than a few armored enemies that lose their armor when you shoot them like they're freaking action figures, as well as some jetpack enemies that aren't too bad. The weapons are somewhat limited, and while some return from the original, the others are either alright or don't control very well. One thing I actually think is kind of cool is that you have the option to cycle through your inventory before each mission, so you have the option to carry a couple preferred weapons with you. What's funny is that hitting enemies with your fists is surprisingly more effective at times. Yeah, you can just punch someone and it knocks them out instantly. I'm still disappointed at how badly the developers handled the stealth elements because it just feels like a generic shooter. Better stealth games came out on the PS2 before this, so what happened? Like I said, there are a lot of good things about this game. The hovercraft sections that I mentioned a moment ago actually control really well and they're really fun. It's just a shame that there isn't a lot of gameplay variety to keep things interesting. I will say that their depiction of the year 2020 is almost accurate. 
And hey, if you're watching this video in the future, please let me know if we have aliens, flying cars, and floating laptop people in the year 2023. Who knows? If I'm still doing this show in three years, I might cover the original as well. And while I'm at it, I might host a live stream on the day I cryogenically freeze myself for over 50 years so I can wake up in the year 2077, so I can properly review Cyberpunk 2077, and a few months after that, I can review all the Fallout games on October 23rd, 2077, because that's the day the Great War happens. You know, that's just a big maybe. This is the M Crew Dude signing off, wishing you all a very pleasant day.